Hey everyone, welcome. Um, I'm seeing a lot of familiar faces, people that I've seen over the past two weeks. It's really nice. And I'm so happy to see all the new faces as well. This is great that people are getting out and, and you know learning all the things that we have to share here. This is wonderful. Um, so I'm gonna start with some of the same things I started with last week. Uh, we have put some security measures in place on Zoom. That means that if you are joining over Zoom, you are muted to begin with. And if you need any technical assistance, please just chat with the host. And then later on in the discussion portion, um, you can raise your hand and you'll be allowed to join the discussion that way. Um, and then for folks here, uh, bathroom locations, we have three bathrooms up here. They are behind you along this curved wall here. And um, masks are still required at the library. Everyone has their masks on, that's great. And also um, these events are being recorded to be posted later on. So if you do feel like sharing, please recognize that and only share what you're comfortable with. Um, and we haven't had any issues with this, but just to be clear, clear with everyone, please be respectful and assume best intentions. And lastly, um, we do wanna have a chance to hear from everyone. So if you're someone who tends to step forward and speak up a lot, that's great, but consider taking a step back. And if you're someone who tends to hold back and maybe not share as much, mm -hmm. consider leaning in and sharing with us what you have to say. So, um, do we have Suzanne Farley on here? All right. Yes. I am going to introduce Suzanne. Um, she is currently, this is Suzanne Farley. She is currently the executive director for the past five and a half years at Wellspring. Um, previously, she served as executive director for CASA in New Mexico, program coordinator at Restorative Justice in Midcoast in Belfast, president of the Homeless Advocacy Coalition in Albuquerque, New Mexico, and executive director of Ciudadano Los Niños in Albany, uh, sorry, Albuquerque, New Mexico. I'll hand it over to you, Suzanne. <laughs> Thanks, you did good. <laughs> Welcome everyone, I'm so glad to have you here tonight. Um, this is a really important topic yeah, yeah, for yeah. me. Um, I uh, actually, when I was a very young woman, I got my first degree in criminal justice, I had a real strong interest in, um, in recovery. Sounds like we've got some other voices going on. Uh, <laughs> um, so anyways, I'll just keep plugging away here, I guess. Um, so yeah, so my first degree was in criminal justice. I did work with the Restorative Justice Project in, in uh, the Midcoast area for a while. I worked with folks coming out of the reentry center and coordinated volunteers that served as mentors for those folks. It was really rewarding work. I really enjoyed it. Um, through my work of working with the uh, folks experiencing homelessness over the years, I've, I've interfaced a lot with the field of addiction. Um, my work at Wellspring, of course, Wellspring is a substance use treatment facility. We provide um, residential and outpatient services. And um, sure. we've recently, we've we're, recent, all, we're all good here. We've recently uh, just um, are in the process of opening an office in the Millinocket area where we are going to set up shop to do outpatient uh, counseling for folks with substance use disorder, as well as mental health counseling for those with co-occurring co -occurring disorders as well. So we're really excited, excited to be up here. It's, it looks like just a great crowd in Millinocket. When we came up to look at the office space, the first thing I said to myself was, my God, what a beautiful community. And it really is. So um, tonight we have a number of, of folks who are going to be speaking on the topic tonight, which is on the impact of incarceration um, and the interface with addiction. We have, um, well, I see I was supposed to, uh, sorry, I was following my little script here, and we're going to contextualize where we've been. So uh, folks have been coming to this um, seminar for the last couple of weeks and the first week. Uh, folks um, heard a lot about the criminal justice system in Maine and some of the key issues. Um, Representative Charlotte Warren talked also at the Lewiston Public Library um, during that first week. And then last week, apparently, um, folks looked at the root causes of addiction and incarceration, including trauma, 
ACEs, which is adverse childhood experiences. They looked at the stigma surrounding addiction and incarceration, the way these issues disproportionately affect poor people and other underserved groups. Also, they looked at the information gaps, how to get help for people in recovery and reentry, and people who may still be incarcerated. How do we communicate what's available for them? Tonight, we're bringing together some public figures with knowledge and passion for these issues, and some people who have also experienced incarceration in Maine to talk with them about how the legal system affects addiction and incarceration. So I'll move right along to introductions now. Um, I think what I'll do is ask each person to introduce themselves, and we'll start with Representative Charlotte Warren. Hi, Charlotte. Hi, thank you, Suzanne. It's nice to sure. meet you. You too. And nice to see everybody. Uh, my name is Charlotte Warren, and I serve in the House of Representatives. Um, I'm in my eighth year. I represent the city of Hollowell and the towns of West Gardner and Manchester. I have served on the Criminal Justice Committee for eight years. And this is my sixth year serving um, as the House Chair. Thank you so much. <clears throat> um, and then we have uh, Jonathan, and I I might butcher your last name. I think it's Sarbeck, Jonathan. This is it yeah. a district assistant. Um, let's see, you are the district attorney. Excuse me. Welcome. Yes. Thanks. Thanks, Susan, for having me, and thanks everybody up in Millinocket um, who were or who have come out tonight. Uh, my name is Jonathan Sarbeck. I'm the district attorney in Cumberland County. Uh, a little bit about me is I was born and raised in Maine, but I was, went to law school down in Washington, D.C. And my first job as a prosecutor uh, was in Massachusetts. And then when I came back to Maine 10 years ago, um, I've uh, worked in York County. And then I started working in Cumberland County in 2016 and was fortunate to become the district attorney uh, three years ago. Uh, one of the things that I think we've all come to realize as prosecutors uh, is that we really need to take a different approach to the, the job that we do uh, every day in court, where we really need to address those root causes that I'm sure people who have been to the seminar before really have learned about. And uh, a lot of those are uh, substance use disorder or mental health issues that bring people into the criminal justice system. So we started to look at different types of programs that we can do, uh, diversionary programs, treatment courts, uh, really connecting people with resources that are involved in the criminal justice system uh, with the hope that uh, if we address those uh, those root causes, the, the substance use disorder or any type of mental health issue, uh, that most likely uh, the person is not going to come back into the criminal justice system. We're going to uh, reduce that recidivism. And I think that this is just a, a more appropriate, more humane uh, way to go about our practice. And we're always looking to improve, always looking to get more resources. Uh, but it really does take a community to start doing this. Um, and prevention work is one of the big things that we try to talk a lot about in the community to talk about those adverse childhood experiences, uh, to talk about substance use disorder, because uh, in the criminal justice system, 70% of people in either uh, incarceration or in our treatment courts have an ACEs score four or higher. And some of them have ACEs scores of four, five, six, seven, uh, which really shows the correlation between the criminal justice system and uh, that sustained trauma at a young age. So happy to uh, see you all here. Thank you very much and looking forward to the conversation. Thank you so much, Jonathan. Um, next up on my list for introductions is Gordon Smith. Um, is he here? I'm not seeing Gordon, so. He's not here yet. Um, okay. We, so he'll join when he arrives. He's coming in person, actually, so yeah. How marvelous. <laughs> okay, and then I also have uh, Wendy Allen, who is a woman in long-term recovery. Is she here? Yep, she's making her way up. Oh, great. <laughs> and uh, I think Kathleen Musharo also. Okay. She's making her way up. <laughs> Had a little bit of a change of plan, so we'll, let... we'll make it work. Hey there. My name is, hi, my name is Lorraine. Lorraine, nice to meet you and welcome. Nice to meet you. Um, okay, did you guys want to introduce yourselves? Um, uh, Wendy, did you want to introduce yourself? Um, sure, my name is Wendy Allen. 
I'm a woman in long-term recovery, uh, formerly incarcerated. Um, currently, I'm a coordinator for our Maine Prisoner Advocacy Coalition, I'm a Young Adult Diversion Program Lead and Policy and Advocacy Lead for Restorative Justice Institute of Maine. Hi, Jonathan. Uh, <laughs> <Nice>. <laughs> I'm also an organizer for uh, MERAP, Maine Recovery Advocacy Project, and the list could go on, but. Fantastic. And, and Lorraine, are you from the community and uh, did you want to introduce yourself? Yes, my name is Lorraine. Um, I am also in recovery. I currently live in Bangor. Um, <clears throat> I have been in and out of prison since the age of 26. 27 from Florida originally. Um, that's when I started using. Um, when I was moved to Maine, I was sober for the first four years. I was here and then I relapsed, <clears throat> went back to prison two more times in the state of Maine. And then I ended up in county jail. And that's when I met Heidi from Breaking the Cycle. I was sober for nine months at her house. And then I left and relapsed again. And I am currently at Fresh Start in Brewer. And I have been sober for eight and a half months. Right on. <clears throat> it's, a, it's a challenging journey, no doubt. Well, I have a series of questions here. And I'll, I'll um, ask the, um, uh, the Pat, they're, they're, you're framed here as politicians and advocates and, and folks uh, who are on the panel um, who have been incarcerated previously. So I'll alternate questions back and forth and uh, we'll just take it from there. And um, if anyone has needs me to clarify something, don't hesitate to ask, okay? So we'll go ahead and get started. And this is for the politicians and advocates um, to start. Can you talk about what are some of the key systemic factors that affect substance abuse in Maine? And Jonathan or Charlotte? Jonathan, do you want to go? Sure. Uh, the question was, what are some? What are the key oh, systemic factors that affect substance use in Maine or substance abuse? Yeah, I, um, to me, it's uh, when you when we have a system that really we have a lack of resources for um, a detox or medically assisted withdrawal beds, I believe they're being called now. Um, it really it makes it very difficult for people. Uh, who are really at that step in their life when they're ready to try to seek treatment and to get that help. Um, and when we have that lack of resources out there and people can't find uh, locations which are going to help them, um, that's a very big systemic problem that we have uh, in this state and, and really, quite frankly, across the country. Uh, so we really need to try to uh, get people uh, to those locations that are really going to help them in that moment. Um, because if we don't, then they are just kind of left to either do it on their own or do it with a, a lack of, uh, to, uh, of help. Um, and so if we can try to get more resources out there for those types of beds, and this is my opinion, um, that's going to be a lot more helpful for uh, people who are ready for that, that day, because that's the important part. Uh, forcing people into treatment, uh, using the criminal justice system, that's an imperfect way to do it. Sometimes it does, does happen, don't get me wrong, um, but uh, at the same time, if we had more, uh, to me, if we had more beds, uh, then the, the great resources that we do have with recovery community centers that we have located in most counties across the state, uh, we're lucky in Portland to have one and then in Lake Region to have another and Augusta just opened one as well. Um, those, if, if people were able to go to those locations and say, today's the day I need help, today's the day I want to take that step, and then we could usher that person into uh, the, a location where they can get that help. Uh, that I think would be a, a, a big improvement um, in our system. And because we don't have one of those, that unfortunately has led to uh, some, some more issues. I think so too. Uh, Representative Warren. Thank you, Suzanne. I would agree with Jonathan um, when it comes to that we have a severe lack of, um, I'll use the old term, the one that we all understand, detox beds. We need detox beds badly. But when I think about the systemic factors, I want to go way back. And I want to go back to um, the fact that we have a lot of folks in Maine who are suffering with pain. And sometimes that pain is physical pain and sometimes that pain is emotional pain. 
and we're humans. And the way that we deal with our pain is we self-soothe. Some of us that looks like a glass of wine at the end of the day. And some of us, it looks like a drive through cheeseburger. And it takes all kinds of different forms, but naturally as people, we want to self, self soothe. It's something we all know, but we've had a real breakdown in the way that we deal with it. Some things like glasses of wine or cheeseburgers are sort of joked about, celebrated, you know, um, totally socially acceptable. Other things aren't, and we involve people in the criminal justice system. I think um, a lot of substance use, now I'm not talking about substance misuse or use in a way that starts harming somebody's life, but substance use is a pretty normal part of also experimentation as, as, as kids. Most people grow out of that. But if you have a lot of pain, I am somebody who grew up, um, I, have, I have eight ACEs. So that tells you a lot about what my background is. Um, but there by the grace of God go I. I could very easily be sitting in, um, in the state prison right now. Um, and and I, was, I was one of the lucky ones. Um, a lot of my friends that I went to high school with they're not alive anymore. Mm -hmm. They're gone. And the piece that I connect back to what made their life different in my life is very young. Some of us got caught by the cops and some of us didn't. I didn't. I didn't get labeled with that shame and stigma. Instead, I got help. I'm 51 years old. And I've spent 30 something years getting help for what I dealt with as a child. We've got a lot of folks in Maine that, that had tough, tough issues happen to them early. And they also were looking for a way to escape that pain. That may be emotional pain, as I said, or it may be physical pain. So, what I think the, the systemic issue is, is instead of helping people who are in pain, we're punishing people. We're adding to their pain. Now your pain is the same as my pain, but the way you've dealt with it, now we're gonna shame you for it. Now we've put a label of, of, of prisoner on you, felon on you, right? Now we've given you stigma. So, so that's where I'm coming from. And, and those are some of the pieces that I think are a part of our systemic failures. Um, we're just reacting to people's, people's own dealing with their own pain. We're reacting to it in exactly the opposite way. We're not helping, we're making it worse. So that's the place that I'm coming from. Thank you. Thank you. Thank you so much. The next question I had for our panelists um, is to really maybe speak to the audience and, and to the folks here on Zoom tonight about what has been done at the state, county, and local levels to address substance abuse crisis in Maine. Um, I work in Penobscot County, and I know that recently the stats came out showing that Penobscot had 30 percent of the overdose deaths in the state of Maine with a population of just 11%. So that was pretty staggering. People continue to die across our state every day. It's heartbreaking. Um, so I wonder if, but we do know that, that a lot of efforts have been underway and, and ongoing. Is it, so I was wondering if any of you could speak to what are some of the efforts that are happening right now to address the crisis in Maine with addiction? Um, would you like to to go? I'm, I'm, I'm not used to facilitating on Zoom. So I'm looking at nodding heads and I'm like, okay, you go, but you can't see who I'm pointing at. Um, 
Uh, Jonathan, would you like to to begin the conversation and we can move around? Yeah, sure. Um, so in Cumberland County, what, what when I became the DA in 2019, I had met so many people uh, when I was running for DA who were doing great things in the field of helping others uh, with, with substance use disorder, uh, either from community coalitions to uh, liaisons on the street that were out talking to people who uh, really were, were, were needing that help and a lot of people in between. And so above, one of the things I realized is that a lot of people didn't communicate. They didn't really, they, the silos had kind of been built up too strong. Uh, and so what we started doing in 2019 was bringing those individuals together and, and really trying to uh, create a, a robust networking group within Cumberland County so people were aware of what other people were doing. Uh, not necessarily so um, they, they might not be in different fields, even though they're all kind of under that one umbrella because they're all trying to help people. Uh, but just really increasing that uh, that communication uh, between these individuals and between these groups so uh, people really could have a better understanding of, of what everybody else is doing. Um, and lucky enough, uh, I see Gordon just arrived. Uh, we have a great partner in Governor Mills' office and uh, the Director of Opioid Response, Gordon Smith, uh, who's at the state level, uh, really trying uh, getting that, out that information, letting us know about resources, letting us know about new programs, uh, that are out there that he can communicate with us and we can communicate to our uh, community. But I think working together, uh, it, this is an all, all hands on deck type of situation. Uh, so we've been trying, I've been trying to do that uh, through the DA's office in Cumberland County. And I think we've had a lot of success so far. Great, thank you. Well, let me take a moment and introduce Gordon Smith and say welcome to the panel tonight. Hi, Gordon. Uh, hi, Suzanne, and I'm sorry to be late, but happy to be you can hear me. Okay. I can hear you great. Yeah. Great. Um, uh, as uh, the district attorney mentioned, uh, you are the director of opiate response for the state of Maine. And I wonder if you want to introduce yourself or tell us a little bit more about yourself. Sure. Um, and then I'm happy to talk about what I think of some of the re resources. Why don't I do great. that all briefly? And yep. uh, I want to say hi to my good friend, uh, Representative Warren. Um, really impolite of me to walk in in the middle of, of uh, her talk. Uh, I want you to know we're friends and uh, uh, we spent some time together. Um, same, same with uh, Jonathan Sabeck and many of you. Um, so I am Gordon Smith. I'm the state's uh, director of opioid response appointed by Governor Melzon. Began work around February 6th of 2019. So about three, three years. Um, I come up here frequently for all kinds of reasons, both recreationally and to work and help you. Uh, we played a role in establishing the peer-to-peer -peer, uh, recovery center. Uh, we frequently hung out with the, the Wabanaki Health and Wellness, and I just left Lisa Soccer Basin and Tom in Bangor, which is why, why I'm late, so I can kind of blame it on them. Um, and, um, you know, on February 6th, I think two days after I began, we did uh, a series of things that we were going to do. And I'll just give you the, the highlights of that because I, I can't uh, tell you everything we're doing. We're doing a lot. I'm very proud of what we've done. And it's also very clear to all of you, uh, both for those of you virtually and those of you here tonight that uh, we still have a lot to do. Um, and uh, what, what have we done? Well, the first thing the governor did was expand Medicaid, Medicaid and now we have 90,000 people in that, uh, that expansion pool. Uh, 10 to 12,000 of those individuals are filing claims for substance use disorder. So in the state of Maine, have 90,000 people newly finding health insurance. That, that's probably the single most critical thing that we've done. We also announced uh, on February 6th that we would uh, insist that people incarcerated in the Department of Corrections or in the county jails be treated for their substance use disorder. It's unbelievable. I, I am a, a lawyer. Um, I should go back through a little of that history. I grew up in Central Maine. I went to the University of Maine. So, uh, and then I went out of state to law school. And I came back just as soon as I possibly could. Um, so uh, we, we're treating people now in the jails, and I was going to say that as a lawyer, it's just stunning to me that uh, that people that are in the state's custody or in the county custody 
were not being treated in with in state of the art medically for substance use disorder. Today, over a thousand people in the Department of Corrections have been treated and are being treated, and the jails uh, we're working on. Um, <laughs> it's better better than it was, much better than it was, but uh, not where it needs to be uh, yet. We also uh, want delivery. We want people to be able to get care. Uh, for the substance use disorder in every emergency department in the state of Maine. And we were doing pretty well with that project until March of 2020 when you stopped going to the emergency room. Um, now we're building that back up again. We also said the most important thing is to keep people alive so that they have the hope of treatment and that we would immediately purchase 35,000 doses of, of naloxone and and to date, we've purchased 150,000 doses of Narcan. And that is uh, mostly Narcan. Some of that's intermuscular naloxone. That's why largely 9,000 people last year survived an overdose. Yes, 632 sadly did not make it. And we grieve every one of those in the, for every one of those individuals. But we focus as well on the 9,000 that survived. We now have behavioral health li liaisons, as you're familiar with, in every county in the state to connect individuals who have survived their overdose to services. And then finally, we said we would train another 250 recovery coaches. We now have, have over 1,000 recovery coaches in the state. So those are the highlights. Um, and um, I appreciate, Suzanne, you moderating. And, um, and I'm really excited about being part of the panel. And it's uh, but uh, I thought it was important to be here with you uh, as well. Thank you. Thank you so much, Gordon. Uh, Representative Warren, did you want to add anything? To the question about what has been done in the state, county, and local levels to address SUD crisis in Maine, is that the question? Yes, it is. Uh, and where are the gaps, too? I think. <laughs> First of all, we're so thankful for Gordon and the work that he's doing, right? Um, yep. He says, you know, can you believe that we didn't have treatment inside our facilities of incarceration? Well, can you believe that we didn't have somebody at the helm just focused on this problem, right? And so I'm really thankful for him and his role and the connections that he creates across the state. Um, and I also, I think we all agree in Maine, you still can't get treatment when you need it. Right. In Maine, if you go to your local emergency room, your, your doctor, the local recovery center, the police station, wherever, and say, I need help. I am struggling. I'm afraid I'm going to die. I need help today. We can't give you that help. But what we, we will do is we will arrest you. I'm not saying when you come to ask for help, but we're spending millions of dollars out trying to catch people right? Millions of dollars in the drag net, you know, trying to um, get the, the little guy who's got this much and we're trying to go after the big guy and we're spending millions and millions and millions of dollars against a war that we lost long ago, against a war that is not on drugs. You cannot wage a war on an inanimate object. Let's not make any mistake. This is a war on our own people. And it's a war on people that are suffering from pain. It's a war on people that need help. So what we're not doing in Maine is we are not getting away from, we're having a really hard time separating ourselves away from those tools and techniques that haven't worked. Jonathan's job should be just about prosecuting people who provide a public safety threat. If you are providing a public safety threat to our families, to our children, to people that are trying to just drive to their job, that's what Jonathan should be doing. Instead, 
Jonathan is having to prosecute folks who are in pain, emotionally and physically in pain. It's not a public safety risk. That's why in Maine, while the crime rate has dropped or stayed the same for nine years in a row, our incarceration rates continue to rise, right? So what are we not doing? We are not getting away from criminalizing this disease of substance use disorder. Jonathan and Gordon both know every year, myself and my allies, we bring forward new ways to get away from criminalizing folks who have a disease. We all agree this is a disease. They, they disagree, right? The prosecutors disagree. The governor comes and disagrees. Uh, well, she doesn't personally come, but, you know, folks come. So we still, you know, right now we're working on LD 1862. It's a bill that would expand Good Samaritan protections, right? If you are there and you are on site when an overdose is happening, we want you to call 911. We want you to call 911. That's all we should have to say to folks. We want police and first responders to come. We want them to save a life and we want them to move on, right? We want to save lives. The administration's against it. The prosecutors are against it. Mm. So, so that right there, that's something we're not doing. And, and I, you know, I don't mean to, you know, uh, personally offend anybody. I'm just telling the truth here. And so, and and you know, last year, same thing. Year after year after year, we are bringing policies forward to try to separate. Jonathan's got to do his job. As long as the laws are on the books, the laws are on the books. We've got to change the laws on the books. So I'll stop there. That's something we're not doing. I'm sorry, I won't stop there. I've got to say one more thing. We can continue, we can continue to put so much more money into treatment, et cetera. And I want us to. But when you're putting out a hand to offer help and also punching someone in the face, right? That's not true, loving, accepting, let me help you. That isn't what people need and it won't get us ahead of this. So we've got to stop with the giving the stigma and I'll stop there. Spot on, thank you. Um, so what do we do? What do we do to break the cycle? I'm gonna move over to our other panelists um, from the community and talk about what were some of the unmet needs you had before you were incarcerated? and. Um, Wendy or um, Kathleen, you can go, whichever one wants to. What were some it's of your Lauren. unmet needs? Oh, it's Lorraine. Lauren. Thank yes, you. that's fine. Um, I think it was help, like some kind of rehab, some kind of help with the problem I had. Mine was emotional pain. I mean, it still is. I struggle with things that have happened in my past. Um, and I just numbed it out by using. Yeah. And I still struggle with those things. I mean, I go to counseling. I have IOP at Wellsprings three times a week. Um, but it's something I struggle with. Breaking the cycle was the first help of any kind of rehab I had ever gone to, of knowing about meetings or anything. Um, all the times I was in prison, four times in Florida, twice in Maine, where I know Wendy from, actually. Um, I never got any help at all. No, just... Yeah. How about you, um, Wendy? What kind of unmet needs did you have before you were incarcerated? Oh, all kinds of them, actually. Um, resources available. Um, really, there there wasn't. I didn't know any resources to for, to have anybody to reach out to. When I tried to reach out to. Um, my doctor, like I was in physical pain after a severe grease fire I was in and got addicted that way through a physician. Um, they just kept giving me more and giving me more and giving me more until one day they didn't anymore. And there was no help. It was, you're on your own. You're going, you know, 
do what you got to do. Well, what are you going to do? You're going to go to the streets. You don't want to be sick. Um, you know, reaching out, trying to get on MAT back in the day. It took weeks, you know, so trying to survive out in the streets until I got into, you know, an MAT program, you know, was, was really difficult, <laughs> really difficult. Yeah. Um, geez, there, just no, no rehabs available. There's a wait list. There's, you know, mm -hmm. nobody to turn to nobody to rely on. You feel isolated. You feel alone. Um, housing options. You can't get housing, especially if you have a label as, you know, being a, somebody that's addicted um, or somebody who, who's system impacted. Um, so many unmet needs. <laughs> yeah. Housing really resonates with me having mm -hmm. worked with the homelessness sector for so long in my life. Um, what is what options are there here in Maine for uh, folks with addiction in terms of finding housing? And, and also what other options are there for help in terms of meeting their hierarchy of needs? And uh, I'm not sure who would like to go to speak to that. I'm kind of looking at all of you. I'll mention something. Mm -hmm. um, so just recently, we have an amazing man um, named Ryan Page who um, has started Access Direct Network and um, trying to bring it more into Penobscot County as well, work with him to bring it in Penobscot County. And, what, and basically what it is, is you call a number and um, he's been able to get people into detox and treatment within 24 to 48 hours. Sometimes it looks like treatment out of state, South Carolina, New Hampshire, or what have you. Um, we have volunteers that transport these people from mm. A to B so they can get somewhere to be safe because people are dying and I'm tired of losing my friends mm -hmm. yeah. and wow. until something changes and you know with the law like expanding the good Sam law or you know something where somebody is comfortable to call 911 so they know they're not going to get arrested people are going to continue to die yeah so if we can get people off the streets and into treatment quickly and effectively then you know, so that is one option out there. And I have the number if anybody wants it. That's great. You can, um, at the end, maybe we can get that number and post it in the chat. Sure. L Lorraine, you mentioned you were in Fresh Start. Do you want to talk a little bit about what Fresh Start is and what role that plays in terms of providing housing for people in recovery? It is a sober house. Um, you pretty much are, are you, have, you have to work, you have to pay rent. You hold, have to hold yourself accountable. It's just a room. You're renting a room. You have to go to five meetings a week. Um, there is a house manager that lives there. I want to say there's 11 houses. There's two female houses and then nine men houses in the area. Um, still, though, like for me, it's trouble finding like my own place. Mm -hmm. Like I want my own place. And it's hard if you have of any kind of record to find a place of your own. I wonder if the advocates or the politicians could speak to, um, uh, you know, this issue about finding housing in general and what's being done maybe at the state level to um, facilitate that. Because really, if you're not housed, it's really hard to get your, your feet on the ground and begin moving forward. Yeah, you still like feel like you're in limbo. Like you don't yeah. have your own space, your own. I mean, it's, I like fresh start but i still want my own place i've been sober almost nine months yeah representative warren did you want to speak or i will or? tell you that it is something in our caucus conversations that we talk about continuously because we know that there is no solid mental health without housing there is no recovery without housing right it is very very difficult to let alone to have your children with you, mm -hmm. right? I mean, so, and I just wanna talk just quickly, I, I can't let any more time go by without just talking about the children and how children in Maine are affected by the yeah. substance use disorder crisis in Maine. If we think about 
the connection between ACEs and trauma and substance use disorder. When you think about a child being separated from their parents, either because a parent is unable to access housing for them and their children, or because a parent is incarcerated, the research shows us that having a parent that's away from a child is really like worth two aces. You know, it carries that much weight for a child. And when we think about the next generation and we think about what we know about ACEs scores, we should be doing everything we can yep. to keep mothers with their children, to keep fathers with their children who are suffering from a disease of either substance use disorder or mental health struggles. But we talk about um, housing a lot. We're, you know, we're looking at a billion dollar surplus right now in the state of Maine, a billion dollar surplus. Wow. I really hope that we are going to see a substantial amount of investment in affordable housing that people need and in behavioral health. So behavioral health being both mental health and substance use disorder. We don't talk about it this way a lot, but one of the best ways to prevent substance use disorder is to help people with strong mental health. And that's something we can be doing across the board, everywhere. We all have a role to play in that, in our communities, with the children in our communities, right? I don't have children, but I have a lot of children in my life, right? Maya Angelou said, do your eyes light up when a child walks in the room? I make sure that mine do every single time, right? And we can be invested in the mental health of the folks in our communities. That's what prevention looks like. Um, Thank but you. The, yeah, definitely. Yeah. Susan, can I just say something? On yes, one? please. Um, uh, we work a lot with a uh, individual who's a champion for getting people on house. Uh, his name's Colin Ryan, and he works with mm -hmm. a man yeah. in Portland. Um, he's somebody who has, for years, decades, uh, really been out there trying to help individuals who are marginalized on the street find housing because he knows, and we all know, thanks to him, uh, how important that is to someone's mental health and, and someone's recovery, just like Representative yeah. Warren just mentioned. Uh, the stats are staggering when it comes to uh, the connection between being un unhoused and the criminal justice system. It's about 40 percent. You're, you're 40 times higher uh, to get involved with the criminal justice system uh, when it comes uh, if, if you're unhoused. It, it's okay. just staggering. And so there's an importance there that I think community leaders and in, in, in myself in a way, but being the district attorney, I don't make housing policy. Um, and we really need to get that education out to uh, any sort of local municipalities, uh, state leaders, um, uh, because the county leaders in, included, uh, to just get that emphasis on housing, because if somebody is housed, there's a better chance that they're not gonna be involved in the criminal justice system. Um, and to Representative Warren's point again, uh, it's a great point when it when it comes to the uh, the adverse childhood experience, the trauma that a child experiences when their uh, parent is either suffering from substance use disorder or incarcerated. And it's something that I've gotten my prosecutors educated about uh, through training in the last couple of years, so they have a better uh, knowledge about the effect that it has when you're asking for bail on somebody or you're asking for an incarcerated sentence. Um, the effect that that's going to possibly have on that child. Uh, that uh, that we might not see uh, the, the, what the cause is, we might not see that effect for a long time. So uh, yeah. doing work on the front end, going upriver uh, to address these issues and, and address uh, these adverse childhood experiences is just, it's, it's quite frankly, it's cr crime prevention in the long run. If yeah. you know. I uh, agree. Suzanne, Gordon. Yeah, it's Suzanne, Gordon. Yeah, mm -hmm. Let me just mention some of the things that I think are going well. Mm -hmm. and acknowledge at the front end that I do think that our highest need right now is uh, what we used to call detox, which we now prefer to talk about medically supervised withdrawal and, uh, and residential care. There is a lot of, of uh, outpatient care available. 
a lot more than there were three years. We've got over 1,250 wavered prescribers. There is a lot of scripts every month. I can see how many scripts are written for Suboxone or Sublocade or Subutex in our in our main care data or our PM or our prescription monitoring program. We've been able to expand methadone. There's now 4,700 patients today in Maine getting methadone. Uh, we, we just about doubled the rates and um, in 2019. And so we have two new methadone facilities in Presque Isle and in Sanford, no, in Saco, excuse me. Those were the first two new methadone facilities. You might hate methadone, you might love methadone. It's needed for some people. Um, I, our, our view, uh, the governor of mine, is that we, we support all types, all journeys, abstinence, uh, suboxone, uh, buprenorphine, in other words, methadone, whatever works for you. Um, so there is, a, we have a lot of new uh, organizations in Maine doing that, including Savita that I understand is up here. Um, we've got groups that got 15 clinics, at least in the state. We've got Better Life Partners. Uh, right here, we've got Health Access Network. I don't know if any of you are with Health Access Network, but they, the last time I checked, they had at least nine waiver providers. So there is a lot of outpatient, and that's an important thing. But, uh, but if you've been really using a long time, and, and even after your five to seven days of withdrawal, many people need residential care. Thank goodness Suzanne's organization, Wellspring, has some of that available, but we don't have nearly the capacity that we, we need. And so that to me, we have unprecedented amounts of investment now available. Some of it's just brand new. If you look at the earmark funds, last week I counted up about $5 million directly to the state of Maine for projects in treatment. Uh, AMHC in the Presque Isle area, a million dollars to do to start uh, inpatient and, and detox. Money for milestone to expand from 16 detox beds to 24. Money to the city of Augusta to do a project HOPE type uh, approach. And I could go on for, if I could remember Mao off the top of my head, a million to Wabanaki to continue their rehab of their gathering, uh, renovations on their gathering center. So um, again, you'd expect me to be, to be here telling you, we are working on this. There's money available, there's money coming. It's frustrating for all of us. Um, and and this, the, the unprecedented more increase in mortality in overdoses. Um, the 630 people we lost last year versus the 9,000 who were who survived their overdose. Um, it, it, it is something we absolutely have to work on every day. There were eight fatalities in Penobscot County just last week. Mm -hmm. Only three people know that and now 33. Yes. But uh, I don't mind telling you that it's horrifying. It's absolutely horrifying. There was probably an, an unusually uh, potent uh, batch. This is really about fentanyl. And 77% of our deaths involve fentanyl. And we can't really affect the supply very much. So we have to affect the demand. So the last thing I'll say in this segment is simply that our plan is that this is complicated. There's not one change that's going to really uh, move this very much. Our plan is all about prevention, making sure that our kids don't start down that road and that we're dealing with ACEs, dealing with trauma, dealing with the things that Lorraine has talked about and, and when. We have to have treatment available. We have to have harm reduction. We've got now 18 certified uh, syringe exchanges where we deliver most of the harm reduction. But we also have, as I say, a behavioral health liaison in every county. And then we've got to have recovery support. People, particularly in early stages of recovery, need a lot. They need a lot. And that's what Lorraine and Wendy have said that as well. So we need recovery coaches. We got 18 recovery centers. We probably need another 18. We've got 1,000 recovery coaches. We've got recovery housing. We're up to 121. We probably need 200. 
So we need honestly more of everything, but um, there's money now, almost, you know, that's been committed, uh, new money, the settlements that you read about, the earmarks that happened last week, um, the prevention and treatment fund that Representative Warren uh, knows about. Um, so I'm not gonna ask people to be patient. It's hard to be, that's not fair when, when your friends and family members are dying. But, uh, but I do want you to know that we have a plan, we have some funds, and this is gonna get better if we all work together at it. And um, that's why I'm here. Yay. Thank you, Gordon. I, I feel that optimism too every day, even though we still face some difficult uh, situations. Yes, uh, John. Can I say one thing? Um, because I love hearing from Gordon about all the stuff going on, because I think it's important for people to hear. Uh, one person that's in your audience right now is a guy named Bruce Nodden, who runs the main prison <clears throat> network. And what he does um, every week statewide uh, is he brings together a lot of stakeholders uh, every week to hear about what other people are doing throughout the state. And I can't tell you how valuable it is, but the other thing that he does that's so valuable uh, is he really tries to help people who are getting out of incarceration, either DOC or county jail, uh, to have those supports ready for them the minute that they leave the facility. Uh, we know that the 24 to 48 hour window when somebody leaves incarceration can be so dangerous, it can be fatal. Um, that when you have somebody like Bruce and his organization and all the people he works with uh, who are out there actually making a difference and, and helping those individuals when they get out, uh, it really does save lives. And so if we can get more Bruce Nodins, more uh, people who support Bruce Nod and work with them, uh, any type of organization that's really going to address that, uh, uh, really be there as, a, as um, a, a support for people when they're getting out of incarceration or, or getting out of treatment as well, uh, and just in general, uh, we're going to be doing a lot better. Great. Thank you. I see that we've got some hands in the audience, and I think um, I was just going to wrap up with one more question, and, and then we'll take a break, and then we'll come back for questions, I think. Um, and I wanted to just address a, a question to our um, community members, and I wondered if you could talk about what it's been like um, re-entering the community post-incarceration and how, um, you know, what, what you're most proud of. Mm. <laughs> All right, I'll go. Okay, thanks, Wendy. All right, um, I got released November 10th this past year, 21, yeah, 21. And um, who, what am I most proud of? <laughs> well, how's it been re-entering the community? Oh. And, and the second part of the question was, if you wanna speak to that, what things are you most proud of? Okay. Yeah. yeah. Um, it's been very difficult re-entering yeah. into the community. Um, inside, everything is structured. You don't have to do your own laundry. You get fed at certain times. So, you know, you don't have to worry about making yourself food or remembering to eat. Um, everything is pretty much there. Like I was a full-time college student. I was a, you know, I worked full-time plus engaged with Bruce and MPRN and me rap and all these other things inside. And you don't realize because of lack of the ability to reach the inside, I guess, or whatever the case may be, the struggles that you're going to face when you walk out those doors. Because then you have to remember to cook yourself food, which I didn't eat for three days. You have to do your own laundry. You have to have employment, right? You have to have housing, all right? That's difficult. Although I was released to a place to live in November, come December, I had no heat and have had no heat all winter long. And to find a place to live with a criminal history, especially somebody with drug charges due to substance use disorder is nearly impossible. I got denied. I paid hundreds and hundreds of dollars in application fees to get denied. Oh my. Right? Mm. Now we have a place that we're, me and my wife are renovating. It's great. But those are the struggles. I had to take a semester off from school. I was supposed to graduate this May. I wasn't able to. You know, um, I have things I'm proud of. I'm proud to, to be alive. I'm proud to wake up every day. I'm proud to 
have a great opportunity working with Restorative Justice Institute of Maine. I'm proud to call half of these people that are that are on screen my friends, mm -hmm. you know, and have these supports. You know, I'm proud to have my children and my mother back in my life. Nice. You know, um, I'm I'm proud that I'm able to show up. I can show up for work. I can show up, you know, fighting for bills to pass in, in the state house. You know, I can help write these bills. I can, you know, be a mom, be a wife, you know, and be alive and fight for other people, my friends, my family, people I don't even know to help stay alive too. Yes, ma'am. Yes, ma'am. Yeah. Um, Lorraine, did you want to speak to that or did you want me to move on? I wasn't quite sure. I think Wendy pretty much said it all. Um, yeah. I will tell you, I'm most proud of, I'm in college also to be a substance abuse counselor. This is my second semester. Um, I'm Good. proud also to have my family and my, my life, my mother, my sister, my son, my daughter-in-law. Um, I'm proud to be working, paying my own bills. Mm -hmm. um, that was were things I weren't doing. I wasn't doing anything, you know? Mm -hmm. So the, yeah. that's, yeah, and that's all I have to say. That's pretty strong. <laughs> right on. <laughs> yeah. Hey, Susan, can I just say one thing about- Yeah. Wendy, if you can't see the comments, Bruce Nodden's calling you a hero and Representative Warren is as well. Um, but one thing that I think is kind of cool is hearing Wendy's story and knowing that uh, our Restorative Justice Institute of Maine is one of our community partners that we work with at the Cumberland County DA's office for our Restorative Justice Diversion Program. Um, so that's why Wendy was saying hi to me at the beginning because we've only actually, I think, only seen each other over Zoom. <laughs> But uh, it's it's um, yeah, it's just it's a great partnership that we have, and, and we're proud to to work with her and and the others at RGIM. So we've got a lot of good stuff happening in our region and across our state. We've got more work to do. Um, we know there's a strong connection between the criminal justice system and addiction, but there's a lot of folks working behind the scenes to try and and get those. Um, get the direction moving in the right direction. I think we're gonna take a five minute break right now. And um, then when we come back, we will take questions from uh, folks in the library as well as on Zoom. Okay, thank you. We'll come back at 7.36.
Okay, I think we'll start pulling folks back together. Diane and Nicole, I'm not sure if you were going to pull people in or if you want me to do that. Susan, can I ask you a quick question? Um, yeah. you know, what is a wait time at um, Wellspring now? And our residential programs it still averages somewhere between four and six months, sometimes longer. Yeah. But I will say that if someone wants to get in, if they call diligently every couple of days, they might just hit a, a you know a moment because we don't. It's not linear the wait list. Okay. It's really about making sure who's still interested because you know we want to bring people in who are ready and and ready to come in for treatment. So yeah, I I handle our treatment and veterans court, our drug treatment court, and our veterans treatment court in Cumberland County, yeah. and it's quite a few, not few people, but over the last couple of years, we've made refer, uh, referrals to Wellspring, and and people have gotten in. I just knew that it took some time, and I was. It oh, takes a while. Oh yeah, with the uh, getting out of the pandemic, it's it's moving or it's moving quicker. But I understand it's uh, it's tough. So the, and the detox program, we're getting folks in pretty regularly now. Uh, we're running near full capacity, but folks are only there five to ten days, uh, so they're moving through fairly quickly. Uh, yeah. So we can get folks in again, just having them call every day to see if a bed's opened up. So. Yeah, Our, ours are usually when somebody, the, the treatment team is recommending a residential for that person mm -hmm. um, yeah. because either a relapse or, or because the, 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 our treatment people, our clients are the, um, the, as you probably know, are the high risk, high needs individuals. Yeah, so, yeah. yeah right. we're handling the treatment side for Penobscot County Drug Court as well. Good. Um, so, but yeah, there's just not enough beds. That's just, the, that's just a sad truth. Um, and, uh, you know, we've thought about expanding, but the staffing issue is prohibitive too, you know, right. so. Yeah, you can you can build as many beds as you want, but if you don't have the staff to actually. Right. Yeah, so. But, you know, things are changing and who knows what the next few months will bring, so. Right. Yeah. Well, welcome back everybody. Um, I'm gonna pull us back together. I think Susan froze. Well, um, while she's unfreezing, I think, <laughs> I think uh, Edie had her hand up. So I'm going to unmute Edie and go ahead and ask your question. Thank you. Hi, everyone. I'm sorry I clicked in late. Um, Edie Smith from Senator Angus King's office. I work out of his Bangor office. I just wanted to add a couple projects to Gordon's excellent recollection of this of the earmark list, um, which we call we're supposed to be politically correct and call them congressionally directed spending projects. Um, but the Macaulay House in Bangor received five hundred thousand dollars northern light system and especially for Representative Warren that home is specifically for women and their children. So we were very excited that they were funded. And also EMDC, Eastern Maine Development Corp received um, $750,000 for a jail diversion wellness and work program under the direction of Lee Humphrey and Doug Dunbar. I don't know all the particulars, but I like the title and uh, they received funding. And I put in the chat, we have been approved for the second round of earmarks. The application process is now open. Information on our website Applications are due back March 31st, but we do think that will be extended because of all the delayed votes that have been in the US Senate lately. Um, but we strongly encourage non uh, eligibility is no, either uh, nonprofits or municipalities. Um, we urge everyone to apply uh, because we had a pretty good percentage uh, last, the first round, last round um, of people who applied and were accepted. Um, it's a pretty lengthy wait for the money, but it will come. And um, so that second round of application uh, for the federal dollars is open. So uh, I guess that's my uh, public service announcement for earmarks. So thank right you. On. Thank you, Suzanne. I think I got I got dropped right at the moment when you said what the source of the money was. I, <laughs> was it? I, I'm assuming it's a Department of Agriculture or it's all our, it, it's 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 all categories. Um, so it's okay. It's basically the, the pot of federal funding um, for earmarks. Um, gotcha. 
and um, you get put into the different categories once you apply. But we had pretty good luck that first round. Um, and so we are encouraging people to apply now for the second round. Excellent. Thank you. Thank you. What, who else has a question? Maybe someone in the audience, if you could raise your hand. The lady in the rainbow. <laughs> My name is Michelle. I'm a woman in long-term recovery, and run, I help to run a, a peer-to-peer -peer recovery center here in um, Millinocket, which is the only recovery center in the uh, in the area. Uh, I do have a question about county jails and state prisons, and do they offer any sort of uh, uh, program for people who want to quit using that starts maybe before um, their release? You know what I'm asking? Well, they have M MAT. Is that what you're asking about? I was asking more like uh, someone that would go in there and start um, recovery coaching or um, uh, trying to help people like you would do in a residential treatment facility, but in the in the incarceration. Um, you could probably answer that better because you were just there. Right. <laughs> <laughs> I was trying to say um, that. Yeah. So, <laughs> In the state prisons, they do um, offer recovery coach training. I actually got certified while I was inside and was a recovery coach for the other women. Oh, nice. um, yep. So they do offer that um, programming is very, very limited in there. Um, we don't have people that do NA outside of mm -hmm. residents forming their own groups. Um, AA, they would have somebody come in once in a while, but very seldomly. Um, as far as other programming goes, there really, there really isn't any. Um, that's the prison level. That's the prison level. As far as the county level goes, I was just there, and no, no. Is you, that because of um, the regulations, or the jail doesn't want it, or is that just because nobody's coming and saying, "Hey, we want to do"? Well, with Penobscot, I think it's because of COVID right now. Yes, they used to have once a week, they'd have an NA meeting um, with outside facilitators coming in. But really, outside of that, there really wasn't anything. Um, and even for like in the prison at, at the state prison level, um, you know, they have the MAT program, but there's no um, treatment to follow up with that. And I know that there's supposed to be Gordon, <laughs> but just to make you aware, there's there's no groups, there's no yeah. there's no preparation really no. For, for leaving. Mm -mm. No, because I left on M MAT from prison through groups, I believe it was. Yep. And no counseling, drug counseling. No. Thank you. Mm -hmm. Thank you for that question others in the community that might want to ask a question either online or in the group hey suzanne it's heidi wheaton how are you good hey heidi <laughs> how I, you doing? good i can't see you but i can hear you i know well <laughs> yeah. my voice is loud so go with me um <laughs> i just had a, a mar inspection today main association of recovery residencies uh inspection and i was meeting uh with two wonderful people um, Brittany and uh, her new associate, who uh, name I cannot remember. Maddie. Maddie, thank you. Um, and so we were talking about, um, you know, what we're offering here at our house at Breaking the Cycle and it being a level three. And I was talking about trying to get some trainings going for relief staff. And she said, Heidi, nobody does what you do. And I was shocked. I said, what do you mean? And she said, well, nobody provides what you provide and i said you mean as far as what i said as far as us taking people to bangor and she said no she said you know what you do here is 24-hour supervision and most of the other level threes they go home at five o'clock at night so again we have talked and i've talked with erica farnlock from wabanaki uh, uh, you know and she actually has mirrored a lot of the policies and procedures and we work together on them for their house that they started down in Bangor for Opportunity House. And um, now she's talking about 24 hour awake staff because of recent happenings and things like that. We don't have 24 hour awake staff. Um, but the fact that I can do this for $22 a day versus, I don't know, you know, and Suzanne, no, no, uh, you know, 
disrespect to you, but I can do it for $22 a day as a former case manager slash whatever in my past and help these girls along the way and make sure they get the same outside source treatment with counseling, mental health, substance use, doctors, eye doctors, dentists, special this, pain specialists if need be, MAT, uh, med management, the whole nine yards. They have to have the same level of intervention. And I can do it for $22 a day. And I'm still getting questioned as to why our budget is such. Well, it's because we provide the staffing to have that level of care. And we're in this bubble of gray area that we don't fit in anywhere. And so my question, I guess, is can't we start duplicating this level and be able to have those outside resources that do exist in the community for MAT, substance use, mental health, all of that, and really focus on the housing. Because the housing to me, I just bought an apartment building. The housing to me is that the girls that work so hard to get where they're going and to make sure that they're set with their goals and they're clearing their plate of all the different traumas and legal issues and child protective services and anything and everything that they've got going to clean up their mess for six months, nine months, however long it takes. Why is it that we can't have sober apartment buildings in our areas to offer them so that we don't re-traumatize our children? When I was working for the Women's Project, it's exactly what we did is we re-traumatized after all that work and those ladies got sober, Morrison Place kept them for a year, put them back in subsidized housing, got their kids back, Within a few months, the children were in an environment where there was drug infestation, meth labs, didn't matter where I put them, what subsidized housing complex I put them, the same thing was happening and people would be relapsing and all that money and all that time is wasted. What I want in our, our community is to have sober housing for individuals so that if you're maintaining your sobriety, part of the conditions will be that you'll be regularly drug tested, mm -hmm and you, you're reuniting with your family, or maybe you don't have any, but you're in a, a natural support system where you can help each other. So that's really what I want to do, is I want funding for housing. I heard some questions in there, but I'm not sure if, if they were just... Uh, I know, I rambled on. <laughs> no, you didn't ramble on. It's just there were a lot, of, lot there to unpack. Does anyone want to address any of the questions that Heidi uh, presented? I'm not sure. There, there were not easy questions to answer, quite frankly. I just, yeah. I would just respond that Heidi, I totally hear you. Um, housing 100%, we need to be investing in safe housing for people. Um, and we've, we've really fallen down on the job when it comes to providing housing. And I just also want to say it's kind of full circle with the way that we started the conversation. Also, nobody should have to live places where they don't feel safe. And if children don't feel safe, there are also adults there that aren't feeling safe. And that is also a systemic issue, right? We have so much wealth in this country. And the fact that we still have so many people living in places where they don't feel like they can grow and prosper and, and be surrounded by safety and community, I, I think that that's a real systemic issue that we have in our state, in our country as well. Um, so, you know, I really liked what Gordon said that, you know, we can't affect the supply side, right? We've got to look at the demand side. A lot of the same issues that would help us look at the demand side around substance use disorder would also help us get out of this trap of low, low, um, it's, it's getting late. This is late for me, I'm sorry. So I'm losing my words, but, um, just terrible places, right? We put people in terrible places to live. We should be investing in people. They sh and, and I think that it, in some ways it's a similar 
the solution is, is a lot the same. So Heidi, I just wanted you to know that I, I really heard you. Nice. And, and Susan. Can I type in with something? Yeah. Um, just to what Charlotte was saying. Um, it seems in my experience, I'm gonna word this correctly, um, that people that are system impacted, um, they don't have an opportunity to find safe housing. The only opportunities available to them are um, landlords that really are in like um, high drug activity spaces, <laughs> like certain areas that there's a lot of drug activity and that the landlords basically really just don't care about their buildings. Um, so with that being said, um, Charlotte, I'm pretty sure you're aware. Um, Representative Talbot Ross and I are working on a fair chance housing bill yes. to be able to give system impacted people or people with substance use disorder, you know, have a history, drug charges, whatever, an equal opportunity to find safe, stable housing in the state of Maine where the criminal background check you know, that you pay for yourself, I don't mind telling you, um, is, you know, they can't, they don't do that. You know, you have a chance to present yourself and who you are today, because we know our history doesn't define who we are today, but we're still being labeled as who, you know, as hold that stigma on, you know, those horrible things that people, you know, say about us. <laughs> You know, so that one, that is a bill that's in, you know, coming out in legislature. We've already had a meeting with Maine State Housing Authority, with Vera Institute uh, working on this because it is so needed, so needed. And that's why people get stuck a lot of times relapsing, a lot of times ending up dead, a lot of times, you know, in the criminal justice system is because they're forced to be in unsafe areas where the crime rate is high and the drug activity is high. Well stated. Well stated, Wendy. Can Susan, I can someone? I just, can I add yep. something? Yeah, uh, and then we've got a question in the back after Jonathan, so go ahead. Sure. Uh, yeah, Wendy, please keep us in with that LD number because I would love to come and talk in support of that as yeah. well. Um, one thing to Heidi, I, Heidi, if, if Brittany and Madison are telling you that you uh -huh. unique things and great things, please share what you're doing with other recovery residences, uh, because I think that that's important. I think everybody here kind of probably does their own pilot projects without even knowing it. Uh, and I think if something works one place, it can work in other places as well. So please uh, share that information with other people. And if you want to reach out to me as well, you do owe me a phone call because I left you a voicemail today. <laughs> uh, great point. Uh, yeah, but it would be it would be great to uh, to learn more about what you're doing. Right on. Was there a question still in the back? I had a note that somebody said, I see a hand up. Yep, go ahead. Um, my question is, um, obviously we, we can't control the supply of fentanyl, but what are we doing about physician pushing of hmm. drugs and not caring about addicting patients? What are we doing about that side of the problem? Hmm. Well, I'm probably best equipped to answer that. Yep. The, the, you know, there has been a 50% a reduction in the amount of opioid controlled substances uh, prescribed for pain since 2016 when the, when the Sentinel law was enacted. We, do, we did just hire two or three people to work with the prescription monitoring program because in truth, they weren't doing, we weren't using that database to its full effect. And one of the people we have for 20 hours a week is a physician whose job will be to, it's not enough to just have the have all the stuff reported. You have to have people look at that data. And, and we now got some opportunities to look at the top prescribers. And you it's complicated because you got to remove the scripts for buprenorphine, what I consider the good opioids, and then, and, and then just compare them with their peer group. So we, we, there's been a little lull in activity, I would say, for the last three or four years, because now, Whereas 10 years ago, the prescribing leading to addiction was 
well, you half of you probably have watched Dope Sick, and it's a pretty <laughs> effective. Oh, and it, it yeah. may be fiction, but it's it's really, it really based upon re real events. Sure <laughs> um, that I don't want to diminish the fact that there are still uh, probably instances where prescribers, physicians, nurse practitioners, PAs, dentists, oral surgeons are over prescribing, but it's it's way improved from what it was. In fact, now the number <laughs> of dentists that even have a DEA license because we made it very difficult for a general dentist to give your kid 90 Percocet when they had a wisdom tooth out. And so most of them got angry because of all we were putting in. So we said, we're just not going to do it. And I said, good. For the number of scripts that you would write in a year, just send them back to the primary care physician. It'd be two or three times. So it is much better. But recently, we have gotten a fed, another federal grant and have put more money back into making sure that is as good as we think it is. And Susan, can I just say something on that too? Um, of course. A lot of that has to do with community education as well. Um, I think that the prescribing is definitely decreased, but it still happens and people need to be aware of the effects that it might have on them if they get prescribed these and whether or not they need to take it. Um, I'm not a doctor, so I, I just wanna put this right there, but there are studies out there that show that extra straight Tylenol and Advil have the same pain reducing effects as, an, as a synthetic opioid, as an oxycontin or oxycodone. Um, and so people really need to know that. And so if they, if they do have pain management, quote unquote, um, they need to know what they're, what they're taking. But I, I handle the treatment court down in Cumberland County. Um, and we still have people who are in recovery who might go in for a surgery and they get prescribed those medications. And it's like, oh my gosh, even when they say, I, I'm, I'm in recovery, uh, I don't want these, they still get them prescribed. And um, so there, there is a, uh, there's an education out there that parents need to know about, that individuals need to know about, um, of the effects of these prescription medications. You, people need to remember just because they're a prescription medication doesn't mean that they're going to be completely safe for individuals. Um, so just really that education is very important. Thank you. Thank you. Uh, we're just about eight o'clock. Are there any last minute burning questions or statements that folks want to say before we wrap up this great conversation? Looking around everybody, I see a hand up. Go. Next to Rainbow. Hi, um, you know, that brought up the, the subject of data and statistics. And, uh, you know, in order to pr to appeal for some of this money and all um, that's kind of falling from the sky, it appears lately, but um, somehow it, it, it doesn't seem to be accessible to some groups because I don't think there's a total awareness of the reality of the problem. And getting county statistics really says very little about the realities in these three towns. And quite often when you, you know, talk to either the town or the county or others, um, you know, it's, it's, first of all, you hear, well, that's Bangor, that's not here. Well, it is here. I just lost my neighbor on Sunday um, to another, you know, substance abuse death you step um, and seeing what our kids are dealing with. Um, and, you know, had I known it was going to be that hard to get statistics, it's really funny because it's plastered all over the, the newspaper, complete with people's pictures. It's plastered all over Facebook. But yet when you try to get statistics, oh, we can't break it down because, you know, of privacy reasons. Mm -hmm. Well, it's not very private. And, and had I known, I would have started manually keeping track. And, you know, I, I just, in order to try to fill the gaps in this rural area, it has to be pretty clear to people what's, first of all, really going on and what it's costing us by doing things the way we're doing it. Just like 
Heidi just mentioned twenty two dollars a day. What does it cost for for jail? Last I saw it was like one hundred and forty or something like that. And the thing of it is, we can't even get most of our local people to participate in the drug treatment court because there's no resources here. And it's, you know, it's not practical to think that people are gonna travel to Bangor for this. Um, and so there, there's so many domino effects to what's going on, but in order to address it, we could sit for a week and talk about all the big picture stuff and, and all that and everybody gets emotionally involved but when it comes down to actually doing something, two things appeal to people. It's numbers and dollars. That's mm -hmm. the only thing they understand. And it's so hard to get that information. And I, sorry, it's not a question I'm whining. <laughs> <laughs> Other than the fact that I'm gonna clone Jonathan and Charlotte, and you're going to spend the next 10 years of your life in Melanot. <laughs> they, they could do work. <laughs> we do. I can help you with that. And, and from time to time, I think we've talked. And, and um, it, it, is a, it is a problem, but it isn't a problem getting you numbers. We have terrific data. We have the EMS runs. We have the ED data. That's we have, where I got it we, was the EMS right. I got the best from. So we, we can tell you in the region exactly what's going on. Um, what we can't do is say that there was one overdose in Medway because there's a f feeling that that might, person then might be identified and if we're saying they died of x y and z that's that's confidential but not to worry it'll be on the front page of the paper yeah. you know well well it, it's it I, I understand what you're saying but we can help with the data but one thing you've said did trigger something that i wanted to mention you are right that the only thing that really matters is the local stuff we can sit in augusta and we're Jonathan and I are both on the 16 member overdose review panel and we're doing a deep dive into a handful of cases. And, and it's, I think something good will come out of that. Um, but at the end of the day, it's what happens right here with all of you and your neighbors and your people you go to church with. It really is. That's why we have 19 community partnerships on the prevention level. And, um, so in the towns and cities and counties are getting 30% of the opioid settlement money directly sent to them. So it is really important in these communities. I know some of the councilors and I know some of the town managers and I, and I know some of the police departments. And I actually think that you, you've got a good opportunity to work together as a community. Um, and because it, it is the only thing that matters, people get well, in, in where they are, where yeah. they are, and you've got a lot more here now than was here five years ago, and five years from now you'll have even a lot more. So don't get discouraged. Um, and and our data, right. our data is really quite quite good, and a lot of it is there on the main drugdata.org yeah. website. We put it there so that people can apply for grants, and we also are trying to do some mini grants because, so you fill out a page of paper. I don't, I can't have people, non small nonprofits filling out GIPRA reporting and no, make it easy for people. We got the money, give it to the people that can do something with it. So um, uh, I'm, I'm optimistic that this is gonna get better. Thank you. You're welcome. I just have a quick question. Is there anything like this happening in Presque Isle and Sioux County? Like yeah. this conversation, is there something like this up there? Yeah. There yes, we have got some wonderful people up there. We got two, two, two recovery centers, soon to be two recovery houses, a um, million dollars to AMHC to get some beds on the ground. Are these conversations happening like this? Yeah, they, yeah, they have a group there? called, um, well, I know April 1st, for instance, that they're having their annual 
substance use disorder conference at at the University of Maine at Presque Isle, and we're all we're all going to be there. And there is a large co coalition. Uh, uh, recovery Aroostook. Mm -hmm. Recovery Aroostook, like Katahdin Respond, there is a coalition virtually everywhere. Um, the Aroostook County does have some unique challenges because it's just so damn big. Yeah. But um, we have one liaison there, for instance. Well, mm -hmm. if she's in Holton and I've got a problem in Madawaska, it's a long way. Right. But uh, yes, I'm, I'm quite pleased with with the way things are progressing. What I'm disappointed in is that that's the only part of the state now that we don't have a treatment court because the district attorney won't, uh, won't, doesn't want one, doesn't want one. And, um, you know, I, I can only do so much. Sorry, Jonathan's taken. He's coming to Millinocket. Well, there's, there's many good ones. And unfortunately, we just made one a judge. So we lost a good district attorney, but we picked up a great judge. And uh, <laughs> hopefully we'll find a, a replacement for him that's in uh, Andrew Scog and Franklin and Oxford County. Can I ask a question to you, Gordon? Sure. Okay, so we were talking about statistics, like data, mm -hmm. you know, whatever. Um, you separate the data on like, so like fatalities of, yeah. of overdoses of like where 911 is called, 911 mm -hmm. is not called, mm -hmm. you know, or like maybe it wasn't a fatality, fatality, somebody overdosed and survived, you know, without 911 or just, you know, people being in the house you right. know, saving themselves. Right. Do you collect the data on that? If we, I, if we can, we, we always report the non-fatal overdoses, which are about, you know, for they, every fatal overdose, there's probably 15 non-fatal. I said 9,000 last year. We know that that's an undercount. Right. Because if they don't call 911, they may well have one of our NACAN kits. And we do try to track we have a very sophisticated distribution system, 150,000 do, uh, doses of NACA, and that's about $6 million. We, we, this is not an inconsiderable amount of money that yeah. we're putting into trying to keep people alive. And so we, 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 the tier one distributors distribute to the tier two distributors, and they do try to get people to tell them if the kit's been used. And that's how we track some that's done. Uh, some that may be at, at home. And obviously, if they call 911, then we, we absolutely track it. Okay. So yeah. there's a lot of pride, there's a lot of saves at home. And, oh, I know. and, and naloxone is a miracle drug if we get there in time, if it's yeah. used in time. Jonathan and I, you know, we can't say much about the overdose review panel because uh, our work is highly confidential, but I, I can tell you that that it, it's really, the cases we're looking at, they're just dis disturbing, aren't they, Jonathan? They're just disturbing several aspects of them. And, uh, and um, maybe people not, not calling 911, not, re not responding to the person until, until way too late. I'm, I'm a distributor and trainer for main access points. Good. So like I, you know, Try, I will train anybody anywhere, whether, you know, just to help save a life. You are saving lives. You are Narcan. saving lives. You know, I was just curious because like, you know, I overdosed five times in eight hours, mm -hmm. you know, and this is in 2018, mm -hmm. you know, 911 wasn't called. I was left there, you know, so it's like, I'm a miracle. I'm, it's amazing. You know, it's a miracle that I'm here speaking with anybody. You know, and I'm like, who collects that data? You know, because the people in the house are too scared to call. Right. Wendy, we, or yeah. I just, oh, go Wendy, we got a statistic, I think, from Zoe Brokus a couple of years ago that, uh, and I don't know exactly how she get, got this information, but it was about 30% of overdose calls actually get to 911 or get to law enforcement. So that means 70% of the times that people yeah. overdose where law enforcement, EMS, uh, 911 um, dispatchers, they're not made aware of those. No, 
It's fear. That's why we need to expand the Good Samaritan protection you are right. in Maine. If I may just jump in, I, oops, somebody else is speaking, sorry. And I was the only one at the call. Yeah. It's fear driven. Yeah. But I thought there was a law passed that if you called. Yes, the Good Samaritan law. Oh, it has No, let me clarify. We did pass the Good Samaritan law in 2019. It was among all the Good Samaritan laws in the country, it was about in the middle. It wasn't the broadest, it wasn't the tightest. It protects the person who calls and it protects a person that's, that's actually physically uh, assisting and it protects the victim. It doesn't affect everybody in the house. Um, the governor supports ext extending that to everyone who assists. Somebody might, might do CPR, somebody might run and try to get assistance. But neither she nor the sheriff nor the police chief support everybody in the house. And um, so we do have a law. Um, and we also de decriminalize uh, some very good work done by Representative Warren and her committee, decriminalize the possession of syringes. And that has permitted um, some of the syringe exchanges to do way more than we could have done previously. So again, it, it's complicated. Um, you have to win the goodwill of your community, in my opinion. It's not possible even to have a syringe exchange in a community if the police department isn't supportive of it, frankly. Right. And yet we've been able to advance to 18 certified sites, including some rural communities, including for the first time in, in Caribou. So we are making progress. Um, I'm not satisfied that it's going fast enough, certainly. And I, I greatly respect Representative Warren and her, her advocacy and Courtney Allen and the whole group. Um, but I also have to live with the fact that there's a legislature that's got Republicans, it's got Democrats, they're from rural areas, they're from urban areas. If you had listened to the debate on the bill that would allow us to do more syringes that was debated in the House, Charlotte, when Wednesday afternoon last week, mm -hmm. I, I listened to the YouTube channel of these committees when I'm not able to see them in real time during the day. And it's one of the great advances of, of the COVID times. Um, Agreed. And, and I found it absolutely, uh, the debate was absolutely horrifying. It was truly horrifying to me that, that, that people that I like and respect and have to deal with, do business with, that they, they talk like it was 50 years ago. Yep. They don't. They don't understand that this is a chronic illness. Yep. That we need to support people, and until they get to the point where they're in, they're ready for recovery, and then it's our obligation to make sure there's a bed for them. Now, I do think we need to be more strong in letting people know that this is not the 1970s. That if they continue to use, and they're not thinking about not working at recovery there is a great likelihood that they will die because the, the, the source is, is so potent mm -hmm. and, and that's really scary. And um, so I think again, that, you know, that's affected the way I look at harm reduction somewhat because while I'm doing all this, supporting all this harm reduction, every Monday, you know how many people I've lost the previous week and it's, it's discouraging. So exactly. I think we all, but again, it's complicated. We need to do to be successful in all the domains: prevention, more treatment, effective harm reduction, and recovery support. But we do have a good Samaritan law. We advertise it all the time in in our social media campaigns, along with "Don't use alone." If you use alone, use an app that can save your life. Um, call nine one one. You know and. Um, yeah, and th those those are our messages to people who are using, and and we try to link them up with a, a syringe exchange of fifty seven hundred individuals who utilized the syringe exchanges in twenty twenty one. 
Thanks, Gordon. I think uh, we've got uh, Danielle has her hand up. Hi there. I just wanted to um, piggyback off of what Gordon was saying about um, it being so dangerous right now and making sure that people understand uh, what is in these substances that they're now taking. Um, I also want to like reiterate that it is it takes seven to eight times on average. I've heard other numbers, but it's somewhere around seven to eight times on average of trying to get sober to make that stick. Um, and so continuing to uh, back the harm reduction is so important so that we give up people the opportunity to find their recovery, much like Wendy was saying, um, if she had been given up on, she wouldn't be where she is now. And she's now advocating and helping save so many more lives, so. Great point, great point. Oh, I'm looking to Nicole. I think she might be gonna wrap things up. Suzanne, may I just quickly jump in? Just of course. Before? I just wanted to especially thank Wendy and Lorraine. It's so, it takes so much courage to sh come and share your story and and just, you know, be up in front of everybody and, and be such the focus of what we're talking about. You guys, thank you so much. Mm -hmm. And Lorraine, I haven't met you before, but good on you for the work that you're doing, training to become a, a counselor and reach out if there's any way I can provide any support and lean on Wendy too, because she'll support you as you move forward, but come and use your strong voice at the legislature and help us change some policies. Okay. Yeah. Thank nice. you. It's yeah. nice to meet you. Thank you. Yes, I wanted to uh, return that sentiment to everyone here on this panel because you are all my heroes. <laughs> and and just like the prior event that we've had. And, you know, that's what I can't imagine. I, I There must be something wrong with me because instead of watching movies, I'm watching legislative hearings. So there's got to be something wrong with me. But um, I've watched um charlotte in action and her dedication and i've also been in several meetings with jonathan sarbuck and i've also um had the pleasure of watching him do a polar dip for the benefit of uh, <laughs> uh, food um pantries and in a full suit mind you <laughs> so, uh, tell me that's not dedication there you go <laughs> it's great so um i really do seriously want to thank all of you and you know we all get discouraged because you can't not in this um, field but you all feed me <laughs> you you all encourage me and I'm sure many others to keep going. And I just want to mention that um, I'm sure it'll be on the town um, town website, on the um, library website. Um, there's information about how to contact the leg your legislator and a, mm -hmm. a couple of the bills and stuff. And I mean, I think people often feel so intimidated, like, Oh, that's not me. I'm not, I'm not doing that stuff, you know, but there is a wealth of information on there. Even sometimes if you look at the testimonies um, that other people have given and, you know, really, this is what it all comes down to is what the law says, because no matter how Jonathan might feel a certain way, he still has to enforce the laws that exist. So, you know, I think if all of us could somehow um, find a way to be comfortable enough to support the bills that really matter, and um, it, it's really not as hard as it used to be. And so that information I see is going to be on the, um, the Millinocket resource page. So, but thank you all. I really mean it. Yes. It wasn't a question. <laughs> <laughs> well, it wasn't a wine this time. <laughs> there we go. Hi 
again. Um, I just want to I want to thank everyone. I want to thank our great Zoom panel. This was awesome. And I want to thank everyone here. I just like Charlotte said, I think you guys are really brave to come on up and, and share with us. This has been really, really special time. So thank, and thank you for coming up. I know, I know it's, it's a long pleasure. drive. So my pleasure. Um, this is the third of four hybrid sessions that we'll be doing. So next week will be our last hybrid session. Um, that's going to be a resource style. Um, we're going to have like people here that have direct resources, things like that. And then we did decide to add a fifth session. The fifth session is going to be in person only. It's going to be more of a um, discussion, kind of just letting people talk about the way that this is brought things up or if they would just like to get some things out there. Um, like I said, that's going to be in person only. We feel like maybe having something where everyone can kind of see see each other and that will also not be recorded. So just so everyone What's knows. The 29th? The 29th, yes. Yep. And um, with that, I want to say good night to everyone. Thank you for coming out and I hope you have a very nice And evening. thank you to the library yeah, and especially absolutely. to Diana and Nicole. <laughs> All righty. Thank you. Thanks, Good everyone. Night. Good night, everybody. Good night. Good night. Thank you. Um, yeah. Yeah. Okay.